We start with you. Hi, uh, Vikram Gupta. I'm the founder and managing partner of uh, IV Cap Ventures. Uh, we are a pure domestic venture capital fund. Uh, we uh, manage about 4,500 crores of assets. Um, portfolio of about 40 companies. We are a Series A investor, so I'm probably the only one on, on the stage who's actually not investing in venture debt. So it's an interesting perspective probably I'll bring from the other side. But uh, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, but we, we did contemplate at one point to set up a venture debt fund of ourselves, uh, which we decided to not do, but uh, we continue to focus our energies on uh, Series A, uh, seed to Series B, but Series A is the primary focus. We are sector agnostic. We are currently investing from a fund three, which is a 2,000 crore size fund. Hi, thank you for having me on the panel with, with fellow colleagues. This is Ishpreet Singh Gandhi. I'm the founder of Stride Ventures and Stride One. Stride Ventures uh, is a fund business of ours where we run uh, four funds now, 3,300 crores asset under management, uh, domestic and international. And uh, Stride One, which is also ecosystem financing around startups. So uh, venture debt is something which we'll, while we'll speak about, but our core, core thesis is around startup credit, and that's what we focus upon. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Vinod Murli. I'm the co-founder and managing partner at Alteria Capital. First up, it's great to see the stage is so big now. It used to be two or three of us a few years ago. Uh, at Alteria, we have three funds providing venture debt. We have about 4,200 crore under management and about 150 companies that we've backed over the last five, six years. So looking forward to this conversation. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, this is Ankur here from Black Soil. Uh, thank you for having me over on this panel. I'm the co-founder of a platform called Black Soil. Uh, we basically finance startups uh, from pre-series A all the way to their IPO stage. Uh, have worked with over 150 companies, deployed over $300 million so far. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Sanket Sinha, uh, Executive Director and Head of Asset Management at Lighthouse Canton. Our firm, Lighthouse Canton, we are an asset and wealth management firm uh, with, with uh, presence across the region, Southeast Asia. And that's, uh, you know, Singapore, Dubai, and India. Uh, we manage circa $3.5 billion of assets, and uh, private markets is an area of focus. As far as the venture ecosystem is concerned, we provide capital solutions across uh, the capital structure. So we have an early stage venture equity fund, and we've recently launched a venture debt fund which again is a regional strategy, India as well as uh, Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Thank you. Hi, Ashish. Uh, you know, I'm with Innovin Capital and we are positioned as a regional venture debt platform, so largely India, China, Southeast Asia. So I think uh, we backed, uh, in India we backed over 300 companies and uh, I think over a billion dollars of uh, venture debt has flown through the platform uh, in different geographies. Hi, I'm uh, Rahul Khanna, a co-founder of Trifecta Capital. Uh, we're a platform that focuses on the growth financing needs of startups in India. Uh, we have a venture debt fund and a growth equity fund. Uh, we also have a services company that provides things like treasury management to hundreds of startups now. Thank you, everyone. So, Ishpreet, my first question is to you. Uh, according to a report by Stride Ventures, so the Indian startups saw a considerable increase, around 2.6 times uh, more when it came to raising debt funding. So what do you think, uh, what's the reason behind this, and why are founders choosing this way? Yes, uh, so uh, what, if, you, if you just uh, see the venture debt history in India, I think the couple of things which came in play first naturally has uh, the ecosystem maturity, which all of us will speak about, but I like to believe I think 2015, 16 was a tipping point when you saw people, venture capital funds being fairly more active um, and the deployment of venture capital started draining grounds. Over a period of time, the way venture debt has been construed, especially in a, in a, bullish, in a more of a bullish market when there's a lot of venture capital flow, is to come on top of equity rounds. So 2021 was naturally one of the best years for the venture capital ecosystem when you saw a lot of equity flow, which in tandem resulted in the, to the debt flow as well. Um, but what, what also happened parallelly as per us is, is maturity of the founders to understand how the debt ecosystem should work. 
because when you take venture debt, right, uh, there is a certain element of degree of comfort as investors, which we get in the equity investors uh, 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 infusion, but founders awareness about the asset class further increased. And at least at Stride, we saw that opportunity to make sure that we create more awareness about the products. We launched in more products, which was more centered around the business of these firms to make them further aware about the working capital cycle, CAPEX financing, revolving facilities, international financing. And I think the, the, the ground started moving in a direction in which all of a sudden they started emulating what possibly banks can offer them and can, can, can venture that firms create those kind of structures. So the awareness level, to answer your question in a summarized manner, I think there are two forms. 21 was a further accelerated year for a lot of venture debt deployment. But post that, since the equity flow has got reduced in the past 12 to 18 months specifically, the awareness is leading into more fueling of taking venture debt as an asset class, and the use cases have emerged. Uh, the awareness is all time high by the founders. And I think all of us, uh, uh, re while representing the various organizations of ours, ensure that we were trying to promote the asset class in general, right? So I think that has gone down well with the founders when the venture capital ecosystem. And um, we see the deployment or the demand being at all time high in terms of various structures. So that's, that's specifically uh, to the 2.6x uh, quoted number. But I, I firmly believe we are just getting started. There's a lot of uh, deployment uh, which will happen. Uh, I think we'll be behind this cycle and you might see a better, better outcome on the debt numbers as well over a period of time. Thank you. Uh, Vikram, if you can tell us about the other side of the story, what do you think about it? So I think, uh, you know, as Spreet explained it very well, but uh, you know, uh, this is, and of course, you know, all the people you see here, of course, they're veterans in this, uh, in this area. Uh, we actually have seen it from the other side, you know, uh, being equity investors, of course, one of the key aspects for us is, uh, you know, once you invested in a company, then you want as little uh, uh, dilutive capital as possible. You want uh, as much as uh, non-dilutive capital coming with a lot of uh, value addition, right? So venture debt to us is actually uh, not just uh, the non-dilutive capital, but it's also uh, the quality of people uh, who come with the, uh, a little bit of equity mindset as well, because they understand the business, they understand the, uh, you know, the, the dynamics uh, and, and the other uh, aspects of the business. So uh, I think as an uh, asset class, uh, we've seen it uh, evolve and it's actually, uh, it's happened in the other markets as well, in the developed countries where, you know, the venture equity market uh, starts building up and the venture debt market naturally progresses after that. Uh, and I think India, in my view, is very clearly uh, ready for uh, absorbing a lot more venture debt. And I think, as Vinod was talking about, that uh, maybe a few years ago there were just two or three people here and then suddenly you see seven people sitting here and then you have another, maybe quite a few who are actually quite actively now investing in this market. From our perspective, as uh, Equity investors we sit on the boards of these companies. We are seeing now, maybe you know, in certain cases, 10 to 12 term sheets coming from all these different venture debt funds. Uh, and I think therefore it becomes very important to see what differentiates one from the other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we are seeing uh, many of these venture debt funds actually building their own differentiation strategy. So I think each one of them here, and uh, we I think know all of them very well. Um, uh, seen that there is a clear differentiation that we can see amongst all of them sitting here. So, you know, there's a very different kind of value that they bring to the table. So, uh, that's good for the ecosystem. Uh, as Ishpreet said, entrepreneurs have matured a lot uh, and they understand this space now very well. So, therefore, they're also now aware who sh they should choose as their partners on both on the equity side, also on the debt side. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's only building up. I think I would say it's, it's just the beginning. Thank you. Would any one of you would like to add to the question, like the answers to the question? Just a comment on the fact there are 12 term sheets. <laughs> That's not good news. <laughs> no, I think uh, just adding a quick couple of bits to that. Uh, there is a market maturity which is visible. Uh, going back, I mean, I think Vikram and I did our first deal maybe nine years ago, and uh, there was a paucity of capital in general. 
not about debt or equity. So India has come a long way. I think today, despite all the gloom and doom in uh, funding, if you look at the sources of capital, we are looking at lifetime highs for pretty much every investor active in India. So India-focused strategies today have the deepest pockets. The economy fundamentally is looking pretty healthy. And we are possibly one of the brightest, brightest spots in the global uh, you know, comparison. Uh, having said that, there's of course a lot of pain in the startup funding uh, context and uh, deals take more time, sometimes 12 venture term sheets come through mm -hmm. and uh, makes life difficult for equity sponsors as well. But I'm very happy with the quality of uh, the founders that we're seeing today. Uh, there is a lot more maturity. I think between all of us, there are maybe 500 unique companies that have been funded. Mm -hmm. So there are 500 founders who've tasted debt and there are so many more stories that go out into the ecosystem which makes a difference. So there's a lot of uh, understanding of what has worked, what has not worked, who has worked, who has not worked, and it's all context, right? It's never the same for everybody. So I think we've come a long way, but yeah, it's still day zero to one, I would say. Thank you. If I can just add one thing, I think uh, as people are becoming capital efficient in this new era, people are valuing debt very early on. Earlier used to be more of a venture debt was just a more, uh, sort of a thing which was used, utilized, part of rounds. But now people, early stage itself, from pre-series A, want to sort of find a way to have a small component of debt so that they can see how it works, and then use it for strategic purposes. Some of the use cases already Ishpreet has mentioned. And based on that, build a more sustainable business, which has become now the norm for the new era of cohorts of companies which is coming in. Yeah, so. Uh to add to what uh, the fellow panelists uh, spoke about, uh, we spent a considerable amount of time before we decided to launch the venture debt strategy, uh, studying the Indian uh, venture ecosystem as well as the Southeast Asian venture ecosystem. And I'm just gonna, you know, put out some of the numbers that that's, uh, you know, that we arrived at uh, based on the study. So we believe that over the next five years, uh, India's venture ecosystem would be absorbing close to 200, between 200 to 250 billion dollars of capital, mm -hmm. uh, which is give or take, you know, 50 billion dollars every year on a run rate basis. India would have nearly 250 plus unicorns over the next five years. And the combined valuation of the startup ecosystem, we expect it to be between one and a half to two trillion dollars. Now, when you look at the size of the venture debt market right now, in the context of the numbers that I just spoke about, I mean, it's sub $1 billion a year. And if you just extrapolate it over the next five years, assuming a 20, 25% growth rate, we are still talking about seven to $8 billion. That's nothing. So I believe that, you know, there's, there's a lot of headroom. There are new people who are gonna come. We are all gonna coexist together. And uh, as, as Ishpreet rightly said right at the beginning, this is just the start. So my next question is to Ankur. You know, what factors do you consider when you identify and filter potential investments? So on a process perspective, sometimes it takes almost two to three months for us to, you know, really decide to do a transaction. Uh, and after having spent seven years, we have started spending a lot of time on the data that we have created over a period of time on deals that we have worked with, we have not worked with, including the companies that are part of our portfolio and use that data to sort of try to figure out which kind of business models are really making sense, right? Uh, because when we are entering a company at point of time, uh, we do not have the view for the next two to three years, and we try to use the data that they have created because many times founders say many things about the data, about the business, how it is performing, but there is a big difference between what actually is the business MIS coming to, and sometimes there's a difference between the banking that sort of really comes into the picture. So we're trying to sort of put all of this together and see whether this company really has the potential to what they sort of state its mark is because already institutional investors are there so there is obviously already a good amount of work, hygiene work has been done on the company in terms of you know the kind of company that is there, the business model, et cetera. Uh, but finally, is this business model working on a say where there's a unit economics in place? Can they be a category leader? Uh, can they go to a stage where uh, raising next round of funding is how important, or is it going to be a company which can start creating cash flows as well? Some of these parameters will look into the picture, and on top of it, how they're capital efficient from working capital perspective, 
and is it going to be a business which will keep requiring a lot of debt or is it going to be a company which can work with a very small amount of debt and really improve its turnover ratios. So some of these things sort of comes into the picture and we like to benchmark those companies against multiple other portfolio companies we have seen and see what, how they are stack up against each other, right? So one of the easiest places we are able to do it is, for example, in the fintech space, right? In fintech, you are in personal lending, you have multiple businesses you have looked at. You can really compare businesses and see how they are really performing across multiple parameters. And being unlisted companies, it's very important that uh, you are not just looking at uh, whether the founders have the right, all of those things in place, whether they have the great cap table, uh, but the business also stacks up on its own. Thank you. Uh, Ashish, my next question is to you. Uh, what is Innovan Capital's strategy when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, potential investments? Uh, I think ultimately, I think some of it Uncle touched on. See, this is a different kind of risk return asset class. See, the color of money is the same, whether you take from equity or debt, right? You can use it for the same things, whether it's to hire people, growth or whatever. Uh, the risk return, Ultimately, we are raising, we are managing third-party capital. Mm -hmm. So the risk return here is we do not want to take as much risk as an early-stage equity investor would. Uh, and, you know, our return expectations are also a uh, little lower. Uh, so I think we pay a lot of attention to, like, you know, you may have heard of this concept of type 1 risk and type 2 risk. So type 1 risk is false positive. You know, something you thought was good and turned out to be bad. And type two risk is something you thought wasn't that good and turned out to be great, right? So if you are an early stage investor, I mean, you are happy to take a lot of type one risk, but you don't want to miss on that type two. I mean, you know, early stage investing is a whale hunting business. It's not a tuna hunting business, right? Uh, for us, I mean, we obviously want to maximize the upside, but we want to protect the downside because in our risk return model, uh, there is only so much credit risk we can take. So when we look at companies, uh, you know, apart from looking at the numbers, founder, unit economics, market, all of the good stuff, and obviously, uh, you know, getting some insights from existing investors who have kicked the tires, who know, uh, you know, a lot more about these companies, right? Uh, I mean, you have to really uh, first always think about the credit risk. I mean, uh, you know, valuations come second. Uh, would you get your money back? Because our investors, uh, I mean, I can tell you, like, in our portfolio, in just on the India portfolio, I mean, we have, you know, for whatever it's worth, 36 unicorns, right? Now, we have seen journeys of uh, people, you know, kind of going 120 miles an hour and, you know, kind of hitting a speed bump. So in this business, I mean, first and foremost, you want to make sure that there is a clear use case of debt. The founder and the existing investors are thinking about, I mean, it has to serve a purpose and whether it is, you know, to optimize dilution or whether it is to, you know, basically working capital, etc. But, you know, eventually that debt needs to be repaid. So is there a, you know, kind of thoughtfulness around that this debt would need to get serviced or is it just a basic thing of, okay, let's add some liquidity and go all out and see what happens, right? So, uh, I mean, eventually the risk return is different, so we pay a little bit more attention uh, to, uh, you know, the downside. And generally, venture debt people are a little more pessimistic. So, uh, you know, if you are an early stage equity investor, it's about, you know, what can go right. And a lot of times, we also have to look at what can go wrong. So, uh, I mean, otherwise, it's the same company, same founders, same industries. Thank you. Uh, Rahul, coming to you, I would like to know what's the first rule of venture debt, like, for you? Don't lose money. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, uh, you know, the cardinal principle is try not to lose principle because our investors are large, typically tend to be large institutions, banks, insurance companies, mm. endowments, and fundamentally they have a choice. They can give money to a venture capital fund or they can give money to a venture debt fund. I think to Ashish's point, these are two different asset classes. When they give money to a venture capital fund, it's to maximize the upside. Typically when they give money to a venture debt fund, it's to manage the downside risk, deliver consistent returns, and predictable outcomes. Unlike venture capital where you have large outcomes and one company can forgive a lot of mistakes, in venture debt, you generally have smaller equity positions in these companies. And if you end up losing a lot of capital, it's very hard to claw back that through equity gains, which typically are through small positions in companies. So 
rule number one is you know don't lose money and rule number two is read rule number one okay. vikram could you add to it so i think rahul uh, put it very well uh, and we also have mostly indian institutions as our lps you know so we have banks insurance companies and these are all equity they're investing in venture equity right so from uh, that their perspective it is uh, uh, looking for not just the uh, upside in terms of returns they're also looking for avenues to build relationships with startups you know so what you notice is that lots of banks insurance companies are now actually investing in this asset class and also doing the same thing now i guess uh, with the venture debt guys as well is basically trying to build that uh, relationship angle with the startups uh, but i think the uh, again if i look at it from the perspective of the equity and i think the uh, given that now we are seeing a very good quality venture debt funds uh, in the market uh, and and of course uh, what we're seeing is that historically you know uh, people have been thinking of series b onwards kind of uh, uh, venture debt uh, with the lower risk now we are seeing that even at series a or sometimes even pre series a actually <laughs> venture debt is coming at those early stages which is actually uh, which seems to be very risky but at the same time uh, as uh, you know uh, uh, ashish and also ankur mentioned earlier it's a, it's a lot about you know your comfort with the with the cash flows and the business plan and how actually uh the certainty of the you know the uh, the future of the business uh so so i think uh, of course and i i presume that uh, the 500 companies that uh, vinod mentioned where the venture venture debt is all uh, deployed uh, i would assume that uh, probably uh, almost uh, the entire of that would have some venture capital investors already there so which means that you know there is not just a bet on the, only the entrepreneur but there is a bet also on the investors who are investing in in those entrepreneurs so effectively you know if the company is going down will the investors have the ability to make sure that the company uh, you know survives not only survives but comes back in a big way i think that's the another bet that a venture that uh, guy would like to make so i just i just want to add you know to the point about you know how important it is to have the right equity sponsor right i think we place a lot of emphasis on who's on the other side of the table is the founder and then what's the quality of the equity sponsor we've done about 5000 crores of venture debt in the last 8 years and over time we found certain patterns in picking the right sponsor for that particular investment i will say though you know i think clearly these are two different asset classes and i think the way we think about drawing the line between venture debt and venture equity you know early stage is about taking concept risk and if venture debt funds are taking concept risk then i think they're drifting into dangerous territory i think venture debt funds should largely take execution risk and therefore i think if you find you know that debt is coming into very early stage companies then i think there's a challenge there and i and i would counsel you know even young companies to be mindful of the fact that debt is an obligation to repay it sounds very tempting when you're raising a seed or series a round to take on some debt with it but rest assured you know it is an obligation to repay and i would therefore counsel everyone to be very mindful of when you take debt in your business right and it sounds counterintuitive right as somebody who's promoting the venture debt asset class and we've been doing it for a long time um it is a double edged sword so you have to be very thoughtful about how much debt you take can you service it and if you don't have the confidence to be able to pay it back then please don't take it yeah i just want to give a couple of uh, different perspectives and one is uh, the market we are in right as vikram said there is, there are investors in every one of those financial companies right and india has traditionally been a very weak contract enforceability market so uh, it doesn't matter sometimes what rights you have uh, you have to still have the ability to enforce that and that doesn't always have to be judicial or legal it often comes down to the kind of adult supervision that is there the board oversight that is there the investors who have a fair bit of influence in the situation versus say a us or singapore or china for that matter where if you take the us market evolution for venture it's very very templatized right so you know that in these kind of situations you will lose some money in these situations you won't lose money india is a haze 
right? So you have to work through different people in different situations. Um, so the, the ability to price risk is also kind of an earned uh, game in India. Uh, it's not so easy or natural. Uh, and a lot of it is not about what's on paper. It's about the relationships. So going back to the earlier question you asked about what differentiates uh, any of us here, I would say it's relationships, expertise, and then whatever contractual terms you have. Because without the first two, you're likely to lose a lot more uh, over a long period of time. And for the founder, the expertise is important. And for the investors and the founders, I would say the relationships become more important because it's not just one deal. It's not just one transaction or one day. It is days, weeks, months, years. We're all in the same ecosystem. We're doing the same work again and again and again. So when you have 25 situations across, say, two firms, then uh, people tend to actually get more predictable and consistent. And that is how you can price risk uh, more meaningfully over a long period of time, I feel. Thank you. So in 2022, it was the fintech industry that was a dominant industry, uh, which had the maximum deals in venture debt. So with, I'd like to know it from Sanket first, what is his opinion about it? And what do you think, like, why is that so? And is there, is there a transition or a shift in 2023? Are other sectors also being more dominant? Look, uh, uh, there would be two reasons why fintech, uh, and within fintech, I would say primarily lending tech uh, would be uh, a big consumer of credit uh, because of the fact that A, uh, it's, it's an industry which is capital intensive. I mean, if you have to go out there and lend, uh, you need to find ways of raising capital. I mean, equity, of course, is the first port of call, but as companies start growing, I mean, they start looking at other forms of capital as well. Uh, it could be venture debt, it could be straight debt, you know, uh, from, from uh, debt capital markets, from NBFCs, banks, so on and so forth. So that's, that's the reason why fintech would continue because, you know, if you look at the startup landscape uh, and amongst various sectors, fintech would be one sector which would be consuming the maximum amount of capital. So that, that trend I expect to continue uh, going forward as well. Mm. Purely from a lender's perspective, uh, most of the companies uh, or a large number of companies that we lend to, I mean, we go in as senior secured, but most of these companies are asset light, right? But when it comes to companies which are in the lending tech space, I mean, you get a security, you get a charge over the loan portfolio, and your expected loss given default when you're lending to a, or when you're like, you know, uh, lending to a company which is in the lending tech space would be lower compared to a lot of other sectors. So these are the two reasons why I believe uh, that lending tech companies uh, uh, have been leading uh, or have been there right at the top of the leaderboard when it comes to borrowing from venture debt funds. And I expect that trend to continue as we move forward. No, like, please add to it. Like, I think you were saying something. I was just saying, hello, yeah. I mean, uh, see, fin financial services globally is the largest profit pool in almost every country you can go, right? Outside of maybe North Korea. So, uh, I mean, it's like saying, you know, Delhi has the most cars. So, frankly, that's the largest profit pool, which means that's where the largest amount of, uh, you know, equity capital would come in. Mm -hmm. And since we are a derivative asset class, as more equity comes in on the capital structure, there is more cushion, you know, because equity is the junior capital, debt sits on top of that. So, I mean, basically, it's a very large uh, space, so there's no big trend. Every country you will go, financial services, you know, when you especially start looking at right from payments to lending to, you know, distribution of third-party financial services products, insurance, asset management, it's just the largest sector. So, I mean, there's not, not too much uh, other reason for why Venture Red is there because that's where the maximum amount of profit pools are there. Let me, uh, yeah. let me add a perspective here. The reason why financial services or equivalent businesses will always have large quantum of debt because it's a raw material. Right? If it's an NBFC business, you're running a consumer lending or a, any kind of, any form of lending of business, you want to leverage your equity. If you raise equity capital, you want to lever on top of that, so you would require debt. Either you get bank debt or you take venture debt. It would be naturally more expensive but cheaper than equity. So it's a form of capital. So since, since we all largely do certain sec sectors allocation as well, post-financial services, it will be B2B businesses. Again, the use cases will be working capital. All of these businesses which are B2B heavy, 
you will find them the, the sales happening in terms of unlocking of a lot of working capital, hence venture debt. Third sector which you'll find us deploying will be consumer again. If, you, if you're a consumer company, you procure goods, you have an inventory holding period, and then you have offline sales. This has to be financed, so third sector will be consumer. So everything which has a financial angle to it, any kind or any form of business, you'll see venture debt being prevalent more than the other forms of capital. So you'll see us absolutely comparatively low on SaaS, typically do not require too much of working capital. So forms and shapes are largely settled. Another point which I wanted to make, I think there was a, some talk on reliance on venture capital. Look, this is very important, integral, to get the sanity and hygiene check done. I think this is a time for all of us to just start playing more vital roles in company. I think there is, there is a time to uh, actually have partner-first approach and understand these businesses, understand cash flow, and create structures. Because I think the best time, uh, because of the equity, lack of equity capital, you're sitting on a best time in terms of getting a mind space of, of the founders in today's time, because they're looking up to debt as an option. If you're able to underwrite businesses well, I, I think this is the best time to create venture debt legacy uh, in India. And uh, at least we believe that it should be cash flow driven. And as you go deeper in cash flow, you'll unlock various answers and unlock businesses which will propel. And especially considering the audience which are sitting here, I see a lot of young crowds. And that's where we have to we have to start going early. We have to start understanding these businesses as early as institutional capital comes in and attach ourselves with various use cases. A macro answer to that question as well. All these, I agree completely. I think for the fintech industry, especially the NBFC market, ILFS was a big issue for, for five years ago. When that happened, it sucked out a lot of liquidity from the ecosystem. Two years after that, we had COVID. And for 15 months, a lot of the retail lending books in India took a lot of pain. So they had huge provisions, and they had to actually convert that to write-offs. So you actually had about four years where the conventional taps were not flowing as freely into this ecosystem. What's happened after that is a lot of the pain has been taken. And structurally, these kind of lending companies need the next full year of performance or profit to actually get rated and come back and get access to conventional capital, which is happening now. So for the last 15 months, you had a phase where they were, literally there was an arbitrage of performance where the ratings were not showing what the actual on-ground performance was. And a lot of these companies are growing very fast. So they need access to more and more capital, but their data was not supporting that access to conventional capital, which created a little bit of an outsized opportunity in my view. Now the performance is visible, the ratings have caught up, and they have access to cheaper capital as well. So sometimes the journey for us as providers of venture debt is also to identify some of these inflection points in uh, different sectors. And uh, it's not like the same size fits all across all time. Thank you. So my last question for all the panelists, I'll start with Rahul. Uh, so on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the current venture debt market in India? Look, it's the best of times and the worst of times, right? The truth is that you know our phones are ringing off the hook mm -hmm. because lots of companies are looking to find a way to stay alive and continue to grow. On the other hand, I think the bar on doing new deals, you know, has to be very high in this environment. So I think, you know, there is a lot of demand for venture debt. Um, I think we have to be very disciplined in this environment because, you know, there's, for many of our companies are loss making and they truly do need at least one more round of equity financing to get to being fully sustainable. So I think being a cowboy in this environment is not necessarily a prescription for good health. So I think for us, you know, we're being very disciplined, we're open for business, um, but the bar is high. Okay, so we'll not rate. So what, 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 do you what rate? would you rate? <laughs> um, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe, no, you can call it zero or 10, right? I guess it's, it's a great time, like I said. Okay. But, you know, for us, we're a decadal business, right? So I don't think I want to necessarily score, you know, six months or a year. I think one has to take a decadal view. I'd say the next 10 years, 10 on 10. All right. I mean, I would put it like uh, six, and the reason is, I mean, if you really see uh, the asset class, which is very niche, I mean, still niche, I mean, if you, you know, we are a subset of private credit, which is trillions of dollars, right? So we're still very niche, but I mean, it, at least venture debt now, uh, you know, globally has started, you know, kind of getting some mind space, same in India. Uh, so that is the positive. Now, the one thing I think to kind of build on what Rahul said, 
See, this is typically, there is not too much seasoning that has happened. So while there is some seasoning that has happened, but, uh, you know, I'll, if you look at probably 80-85% of all capital that has been deployed in venture debt has come in the last two to three years. Because the market was very small. And in this kind of an asset class, the jury will be out, I would say, another three, four years from now. So given the, the unique nature, the risk return, I think all of us here and, you know, other, you know, kind of peers of ours, I mean, can they deliver the kind of returns that we promise, um, you know, for the risk that the investor is taking? I think the jury will be out in the next three to four years because, uh, I mean, demand is there, but, uh, you know, I mean, if this was a 2020 over game, we are in the fourth over and, you know, third ball is still to be bowled. So, uh, I mean, it depends on how you view the question. If you talk about the growth prospect of uh, venture debt market in India, I would rate it a 9 on 10. But if you talk about where it stands today, it's a 3 on 10. But uh, just adding to what uh, Rahul and Ashish said, you know, we are uh, early innovators in this space in venture debt. You know, uh, I mean, some of these guys can really call themselves early innovators. I'm, I'm a bit of a, we are, a, like, you know, Lighthouse Canton is a bit of a late starter but we are still scratching the surface. There's a lot that's riding on our shoulders, you know. Uh, it's, it's a niche asset class, still early days. Something goes wrong, it can be, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it can be a breakdown for the product as well. I mean, it happened in supply chain financing globally, a name that I would not like to take, but it's happened, right? So uh, we, while, while we see where we are and where we can be, we can't be cowboys. We have to be very prudent, judicious when it comes to lending. And I hope that collectively, you know, as a group, that's that's what we are going to do and take the market to where it really deserves to be. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree with all my uh, fellow panelists so far. Uh, I think I would broadly rate it around 6 on 10 uh, in line with Ashish. Uh, I think since we started back in 2016, we have seen the real evolution of the industry happen so far. And there's been a good amount of sophistication in terms of the products that has come in. Uh, a lot of competition also has come in, which also ensures that uh, the companies are getting best of terms as the providers, you are also trying to provide the best of quality of services and your uh, underwriting also is also at the edge. Uh, I think the cycles, the way we, live, we are living in, the cycles are getting really fast. Uh, nobody could have predicted 2021, what will happen after that, and it quickly changed. What we're going through today also will not last forever. Uh, but the jury comes out in debt very quickly because these are all amortizing products, so the capital needs to be recycled much faster. So we will not maybe even have to wait for three, four years to see how the underwriting was for multiple funds. Uh, we'll start seeing the quality much sooner than that. And unlike VC firms, which are looking for a long-term, uh, longer horizon of their funds, ours is much shorter. And uh, the kind of names that we are seeing in terms of the which is coming in the media on corporate governance issues, you start realizing that your corporate governance standards, your underwriting standards, the way you look at your companies, is an evolving process. It's not that you, what we do, what we did back in 2017, not what we do today. And every day we are learning from the market and improving our process. So this is the case for everybody in the, in, in, in all the players in the market. And I think uh, almost as the numbers that we see is very exciting, but still there's a lot of work to be done till we reach some of those numbers because uh, we have to ensure that we are picking the right kind of uh, companies that we are backing and the use cases are right. And at the same point of time, the risk element is really spent time on because we are not a return game. We are more on the risk side, uh, as Ashish also mentioned earlier. So keeping all these parameters together, I think there is a lot that can be done, a lot we are already doing, uh, and I think uh, we are barely scratched the surface. I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than all these guys here. <laughs> so I've been doing this probably the longest, about 15 years now. And uh, I mean, I would say it's at about an eight. Uh, different reasons for that. Ten years ago, what we did in a year, we do in a month at this point, in terms of uh, velocity of transactions. Uh, the first phase, I would say, till about 2014, was a lot of just awareness, evangelization, getting everybody to understand what this product actually is and isn't. Today, I think uh, it's collective effort here. There's been a lot of unlocking of domestic capital that has happened. There's also been foreign capital that has shown interest to come into the space. Uh, 500 plus founders who benefited from this product. 
And if the long term view is that India is a very strong venture destination, I feel venture debt as a proportion of venture equity is going to actually increase sharper than people expect. And the correlation with the US market, I think we are already moving past that. So uh, I think 2013 was when I felt the weakest. I thought the market didn't have too much depth at that point. But this vintage, I think, would turn out to be possibly one of the best, uh, you know, in, in any form, equity or debt. I think uh, the founders are coming through the finish line now to get access to capital, build strong teams, I think are poised for massive success because the tests are harder. So definitely more optimistic. So I would say eight. So I, I, I uh, actually benchmarked this since 2018 when we started, or when I started. Uh, that point of time, we had certain numbers of venture debt which was getting deployed, and there was a perspective of founder. I think we can safely say it was around three to four out of ten, um, both ways. What we how, where we stand or sit today, I think what uh, Vikram's point: twelve term sheets, fighting to get into a company with competitive pricing, innovative products. Every company is aware about what venture debt is as a term and how it works to an extent, or what structures you are talking about has started. They started speaking about it. So definitely you are, maybe with Binod, 7 to 8 out of 10 on both the parameters. But the most important point is the macro point, right? We are billion dollar venture debt, second largest globally. We're just getting started. And how you see three or five years hence is easily a three to five billion dollar opportunity. And percentage of venture debt to his point as well it will definitely increase because there'll be more players, there'll be more structures, there'll be more innovation around how it should be done. I think there should be more awareness towards how we can handhold founders. That will improvise as, as, as companies grow larger and depth of understanding increases. So yeah, sanguine times ahead, but definitely very positive about this. So I'll, I'll give a slightly different perspective. So and I'll look at these ratings from the supply side and the demand side. You know, the supply side is the amount of capital which is available. If you go to the LPs to raise venture debt, I think the penetration, if, if we rate these based on the penetration, and my personal view is that I think we are only two out of 10, which means that you can actually raise five times more capital than you're actually raising today, which is available, which if you go and just talk to the people, I think there's capital sitting there. You actually go and tell them this is an asset class, you know, this kind of characteristics of this asset class. Uh, would you like to invest in it? I believe that you can find five more times, five times more capital than is actually there in this asset class today. On the demand side, which is actually how much actually is getting consumed by these startups, we're talking about 100,000 roughly, give and take, uh, DPI to registered startups. Our estimates say that about 25 to 30,000 of them are seed or angel funded, about four, four and a half thousand are seed, uh, uh, sorry, series A funded. Uh, we know talked about 500, which are venture debt funded today. I think you can actually double that number at least so we're talking about a penetration of five out of 10 there on the demand side. So I think I, I look at it from that, you know, demand and supply side slightly differently. 